And if I could say one of the beautiful things about painting is that I can listen all day long to an audio. I'm so jealous of this. With yeah, this is. I go through five books a week easily. I am. Yeah, I'm so jealous of that with illustrators that they get to uh, listen to audiobooks or or like can have a, like a, a documentary or something on and 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 kind of split their attention that way while they work. Because you said earlier you can listen to piano music or something without words. Yes. You can't listen to anything. I'm re I have to be really specific about my soundtrack when I'm writing and and kind of design it yeah. to the thing that I'm writing each time. Um, for yeah, for a different book, for a different book. Uh, so on a project, I'll, I'll kind of set up either genres of music or even specific playlists that I'm going to listen to for that book. And then hearing those songs brings back memories of those books. But I'll talk to John Clausen all the time uh, and just feel like it's this like uh, kind of mutual destruction pact that we have. They'd be like, I know he's on deadline and I'm on deadline. And if we both talk for four hours today, then we're both you know, in, in the same amount of trouble. And then I'll realize that he's just been like drawing turtles for four hours while talking to me and has gotten a ton of work done and I haven't done anything. Oh, I get so mad. I just, like, I just figured this out a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I grew up. My mom uh, got all my books at garage sales. It was very important to my mom that I have a library, um, but we couldn't really afford new books. So we went to the library a ton, would get the big stack and take those home um, and, and bring them back. But, but she wanted me to have books on my shelves, and it was really lucky, actually. So I grew up sort of with the previous generation's children's books and the generation before that, which kind of inadvertently meant that I had picture books from 1945 to 1975, which for me is sort of this last great golden age of American picture books. Um, but they were just my books, like, uh, and, and they influenced my work so much now, but they were just, you know, they were just the books that we'd pull off the shelf as a kid. Um, and I think they really, they really got into my brain. They never came off my shelf either. As I started writing novels, my mom left all my picture books out. And so I write novels, but still take picture books down. And then by high school, I was tutoring younger kids, and so I was taking my pictures, picture books out to read to them. So picture books just always stayed really central to my, my life and my reading. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me. I never heard that before, but uh, you have kind of a classic sense of, of writing, I think. I think I, I really, like, I feel like... I, I love the style of those books, I, and I think they're so daring. The classic books, the, the, like the traditional picture books from that time, these things that are called classic and traditional, they're all really experimental and bold and, and crazy. Yeah. That like Traditional in picture books means experimental, and actually when you see books now, sometimes conventional books are called traditional, but, but there's nothing, there's nothing yeah. traditional about orthodoxy or convention in, in picture books. Yeah words to me when they as soon as they come into my head they're pictures so and I think every good writer would hope that a reader would feel that way about their words uh, no matter what the genre is but as a kid I would read even books like uh, you know the Arabian Nights and um, or like um, some of the uh, classics like uh, you know even Plato Honestly, I remember as a kid, like maybe 10 years old, reading Plato. Here we go. <laughs> I think the thing I would tell my 10-year-old self um, is, is uh, I mean, it's a specific practical thing, which, which would be to, to learn as many other languages as possible. I would love to talk to myself even before 10. I think it would be even easier to acquire then. But I wish, I, I, I feel really stuck on that now. I speak a little bit of Spanish. Um, it gets better quickly if, I, if I'm speaking Spanish for a little while, but as soon as I don't, it atrophies. And 
I just, I, I so it was never articulated to me in school why this uh, was important. The, the fact that it was social, the fact that you could go to other countries and communicate and connect with other cultures on a level that you can't by just reverting to English, which somebody will probably meet you more than halfway on, that you can make friends and, and read literature in other languages. It was always, it was so rote. I didn't understand why I was learning this other thing. Everything was utilitarian. And it was basically like not soon after that I graduated from college that I realized that I had lost the opportunity to just devote a big part of my life to learning other languages and that I had made a huge mistake. Uh, so yeah, I, I, think, I think I would tell my 10 year old self to, to really throw himself into the learning of languages. Um, I had, I was, very slow into the world of collaboration and I love it so much now I can't imagine why I w wasn't doing that earlier. What I mean by that is sharing ideas like what I was talking about earlier, taking a manuscript and working with it. And I would love to work with um, the authors actually you know, in the same room all the time. Uh, but I didn't like that when I was a kid. When I was 10 years old I would just hole up in a corner and do my own thing. And I think that was very, uh, that was good for me to become an artist and to be able to concentrate and and be able to do the same thing for hours, which is very important for what I do. But I think it took me a long time to get into the idea of sharing ideas and that would make my ideas better. I think I thought, my ideas are just fine the way they are, you know, which is never the case. <laughs>